terrific. And now a very big welcome to our special guest, Venerable Chanda Bhikkhuni Terra. She is the only fully ordained female or monastic in the UK in the Theravada tradition. And she's also spiritual director of the Anakampa Bhikkhuni Project. In, uh, she established this project in 2016. And it's a charity committed to spreading the early Buddhist teachings and developing a monastery where for the first time in the UK, women will be able to train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. Uh, and she recently moved into that property. So it's a very exciting time. And I would turn to welcome and thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Really lovely to be here. I, I know, I know you're busy. Can, can we uh, first go back? And I'm curious as to how you first heard the Dharma, how you first became involved or heard about Buddhism because the UK is more of a Christian country. Yeah, that's true. And um, my family were certainly not religious. I think um, most of us used to talk quite a bit about how religion can create a lot of divides and conflicts. And we were very staunchly kind of, uh, what's the word? atheist <laughs> but I think it was in my teens that I started getting this kind of compelling urge to understand why I'm here and the meaning of this life and I couldn't find those answers in the society around me because most of the meaning that was offered was through work or family or making you know making your way in the world and for me that just seemed not to answer my question around why we are here and how we can live compassionate lives. So, um, yeah, a burning urge for a sense of purpose arose when I was in uh, around 15 or 16. And I guess at that time it was hard, especially for my parents, to differentiate that from sort of teenage rebellion. Um, but to me it felt significant and it didn't really let up. <laughs> so when I was about 19 and finally had a bit of freedom, you know, I was officially an adult. Um, I drew on a small amount of money that my grandmother had left me and managed to get a ticket to India with my best friend. And we had no idea what we were letting ourselves in for at all. So there was a lot of culture shock and disorientation and, you know, experiences that we couldn't even put words to. We just it was another world. But I quickly realized that the people over there seemed to have that sense of purpose and meaning at least a sense that there's something bigger than themselves, that they were sort of contained within. And that sounds a bit mystical. That's not exactly the Buddha's teaching, but still it gave me a sense that there was something giving these people an inner strength. And I think for me, the realities of impermanence and suffering were very obvious in that society. You know, in Western societies, or let's say more capitalistic societies, death and difficulty and differences are also kind of kept behind closed walls um, we don't really see them and in India I just saw the entire gamut of humanity you know from the kind of um, desperation of poverty to this incredible spiritual search that had many many forms to it and so it was in India that I first heard about meditation heard about retreats and when I heard the, through my own practice, I was, I was meditating and watching my mind, but I was also hearing that the Buddha spoke about suffering. He addressed the matter of suffering at a very deep level. And it just so, resonated really. And which end, you found a Buddhist center in, in, in India? It was a Vipassana center. It was uh -huh. a um, meditation center under the um, guidance of Goenka, SN Goenka, who was a, Indian teacher um, from a Burmese tradition and the retreat is very intense so you don't really have a way to uh, distract yourself from what's going on in your mind. <laughs> and from there because I understand uh, you went to Burma? That was many years later so from there I decided to dedicate my life to the practice it was a sort of instant sense of this is going to be my path and I spent the next probably seven or eight years deepening my practice through serving also on those retreats and because the tradition came from Myanmar I was always curious about 
going there and the aspiration to ordain was deepening every time I meditated. So finally I managed to, I, I made a few trips to Burma in that time, but uh, it was very, very hard to find an opportunity to take robes as a woman. Um, there were very few places that would accept you, few places that you could meditate, you know, in the way that I would like, wanted to, wanted to meditate. And so, yeah, it took about 10 years until I actually found an opportunity in Myanmar to ordain. Really? Mm. And, and where was that? Was that uh, in a so that was with my, sorry, yeah, that was with my teacher, Sayado Upanyajota, who is uh, a very well-renowned monk in Myanmar, but not really known about in the West, partly because he only speaks Burmese. So I had to learn the language. Um, and I guess just a hidden gem. <laughs> so he, the lifestyle was very simple. And he ordained you? Yeah, he ordained me in Myanmar on eight precepts. So uh -huh. the the usual ordination platform in Burma is eight precepts or 10 precepts. But there's not a lot of difference between the two because, uh, yeah, you, I had all the conditions really to live a very enriching renunciate life. And even on 10 precepts, the problem is that um, there's no actual systemic structure to support that. You really need to rely on family and friends. Even, even when you're in Burma or Myanmar? Pretty much. I mean, I've noticed that most of the nuns, um, you know, even if they're on 10 precepts, they kind of have what they call a capia to kind of keep funds aside for them and to use funds. So usually those funds are their own funds from family or friends or whatever. Um, so yeah, there aren't really any structures or systems of support that allow you to enter the Sangha fully and to be recognized as a field of merit as a member of the Sangha in the way that monks are. And, and from there, I understand uh, Acham Brahm was um, uh, was the one who uh, guided you next. And I'm curious as to how you met. Yeah. So this happened because I was in Myanmar practicing in a way that I was finding extremely beneficial and um, really committed to to practicing there under my teacher. But I got very sick. And it wasn't the kind of sickness that would just disappear. I mean, when you live in Asia, it's normal to get infections and parasites and you just take it, you know, you just take it on the, I don't know how you say that, with a pinch of salt or with yeah. like a packet of antibiotics and you carry on. But this was chronic. It was something that was quite alarming in a sense and wasn't getting resolved. Mm -hmm. And uh, around the same time as wondering what that meant for my future, I got hold of some little uh, recordings of Ajahn Brahm's early Reigns talks. Quite a different Ajahn Brahm from the Friday night public speaker that we see now. And very, very deep Dhamma that went straight to my heart. And I just had this compelling sense of I need to find this teacher. It was visceral and it was inspirational for me. Also, I was hearing Dhamma in English for the first time in many years. And something about that just soaks in in a different way. And I guess it came to me at a time when I was already having some insights into the kind of practices he taught, the kind of approaches that he taught. And I just kind of went on a wing of faith to try and find this teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so two years later, I made it to Perth. Yeah, I was sort of wondering, I was a wandering nun in Europe for a while. I met him a couple of times and did retreats with him, expressed my wish to, you know, be under his guidance. And I think he took me in, um, but it wasn't for two more years till I, I had the chance to get to Australia because there just aren't many opportunities for women. Uh, and uh, you did uh, the Reigns retreat, your first Reigns retreat with him then? Yeah, that was 2012. So that was my sixth or seventh Reigns retreat that I did in Perth. And uh, yeah, I think he knew that I was looking for a, a, a way to continue my monastic life under his yeah. guidance. Yeah. yeah. And, and so from there, did you start going back to the UK? And uh, no, I, no. Hope were, I hope you were well too. <laughs> <laughs> no actually I, I settled in Australia for a good while um, 
and first I went over to Santi Monastery in New yeah. South Wales, which yeah. is now Bikini Monastery. At that time, Bhante Sajata had just left his abbot yes. role. Um, and Ajahn Brahm, even though I was only a novice at that time, he seemed to want me to kind of take some sort of leadership role there. So he always sort of seemed to think that I should do that. I don't know why. I was very reluctant to do this. Um, so in the end, yeah, in the end, it didn't work out. And he said, well, stay in Perth and take the Bikuni ordination. So I said, oh, well, if that's being offered, why wouldn't I receive it? So I never looked for the ordination. It was something that just came as a gift. And I think for any woman who is interested in or has taken the first steps, you take them with your full heart. You don't take half an ordination. You renounce. You renounce 100%. So in a way, it was just, of course, you would take the full training on that the Buddha laid down. So, um, yeah, I stayed in Damasara Monastery for about three, three and a half years and trained there as a bhikkhuni. And that must have been one of the first bhikkhuni um, ordinations that... um... Uh, I think it was the third it was the third yeah so the first one was in 2009 with four bikunis and then there were two more nuns in 2012 Venerable Minister and Venerable Posada and then ours was 2014 four of us again so I think I was the 10th or something like that and and of course Archman Brahm going out on a limb yeah yeah he'd already done that Yes. You're already on a limb, so to speak. And I think there were no regrets. You know, there was a sense that the monasteries in Perth were operating more and more in alignment with the early Buddhist texts mm-hmm. and less and less with this Thai flavor. I mean, of course, the training in Thailand is the training of simplicity, right? A, a quite um, a close, um, what's the word, relationship with the Vinaya. Um, but I felt it was more friendly, more welcoming and more democratic, actually, than many of the systems that sort of passed down from teacher to disciple. Here it felt like we were taking the Buddha as our guide and that was inspirational for me. And what difference did it make be taking that full ordination? Uh, you know, how, that's a how, good how, did, how did you change or your yeah. life change? Right. It's an interesting one, because I think often when we think about taking an ordination, and I love the way you put that, I don't believe we become bhikkhunis, that's another identity, um, is that we imagine, I don't know, that somehow, uh, I don't know, somehow we become we have more privileges in some way, but actually it's the opposite. It, it's um, a deeper renunciation. And I think it opened me to being more ready to take the guidance of my teacher in a sense and take the guidance of the Sangha. So one of the beautiful things that we chant at the ordination is um, may the Sangha lift me up out of compassion. And I think that was a very visceral experience that now for the first time I was actually being taken in to the Sangha that the Buddha established rather than having renounced, but somehow not having my place Mm. and always having to sort of negotiate for a little bit of place, a, a bit of ground to stand on, to practice or to sit on or to walk on. You know, simply, it sounds like instead of being an individual, you were part of the team. Right. Something like that. That's that's a summary. Yes. In a sense. Yes. And even though a lot of my monastic life since has been sort of pioneering this project and in a sense being alone, it's in a wider context and it's a global context, too. We'll, we'll talk about that next. But how important is it for you to still do these long reigns retreat? How do you balance that with yeah. the very demanding um, project you've undertaken? Right. I think from the beginning of this project, I knew that the only way to do that, I wouldn't agree to it really, um, was to still have these three month retreats because I essentially came into monastic life as a meditator, as somebody who loves to meditate and who spent, you know, 18 hours of my day in Myanmar meditating. And um, for me, that's the foundation of everything I do. You know, there isn't much of a point in having a monastery if it isn't going to support the awakening 
of whoever comes here. And for that, the leader has to be practicing. They don't have to be fully enlightened, otherwise we'd never start. <laughs> but I think we have to be practicing to, um, you know, to the extent that we can give a bit of guidance to others. So for me, that's obviously the heart of my monastic life. It's the, um, yeah, the, the goal is the direction, right? We, we do this for the sake of Nibbana. Another thing we say at the ordination ceremony is may you give me the going forth for the realization of Nibbana. And the, this is a very clear framework for everything that we do. So Patton Abram ordained you at that, that time, 2014, I think you said. Yeah. When, when did he first... Um, <laughs> talk about this idea of, of a monastery and why because you know there are Buddhist centers for for nuns at least in in the UK so oh, why did he have this clear idea of Bikuni monastery yeah well uh firstly the Bikuni Sangha ordained me so just to just to make the kind of um technical point a, bit, a little bit more clear that um, my preceptor was actually Aya Santini from Indonesia, who I haven't actually met since, and I would love to meet and pay my respects to. And the Bhikkhu Sangha do the confirmation. So then you're considered ordained on both sides, but the official ordination is with the Bhikkhuni Sangha and uh, you're accepted by both Sanghas. So Ajahn Brahm is my mentor and guide, and to some extent, yeah. Um, second preceptor let's say okay. so um, yeah I was staying at Damasara for two or three years by then and I realized that okay at Damasara there's a lot of resources there are also a lot of bikunis but there aren't many bikunis or opportunities anywhere else and I don't know something to do with wanting to be under Ajahn Brahm's guidance something to do with me having made myself available to serve and then also having, I guess, England as a home country in common. And actually the way it happened was it's sort of as a joke. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows this. <laughs> but it was kind of a joke. I just said to him, well, Ajahn, you know, I don't know about, you know, the future, but maybe I should go and do something in England. And, you know, we were just joking, having a casual chat. And he just became suddenly kind of serious in a quite dramatic way and said, yes that's what you should do if you're my disciple you should go to establish a monastery in England and it was kind of a joke because Ajahn Brahm never says that's what you should do he always just supports whatever you know a person wishes to do but I took it kind of seriously I meditated with that for the Vasa 2015 and at the end I said oh you know when we talked about that were you actually serious and then he said oh just go over and see just go over and sort of see if there's any interest. It's and I was coming here anyway on a visit. You didn't even have a centre in the UK. As nothing, I had nothing. I had so nothing how did you start? Yeah, this was crazy, actually. I literally <laughs> came back on a, um, a return ticket. Well, it was supposed to be a return ticket to visit my family for a month. Okay. And um, <laughs> while I was there, my friend in Perth had told me, you need a Facebook account. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Because I'd always avoided Facebook. But she said, you need a Facebook account because otherwise how's anyone going to know who you are or what you want to do? So I did that. And I just started collecting a few unknown people who said, oh, this is something that needs to happen. So I told that to Ajahn on the phone and he said, uh, oh, that's good. And I said, yeah, but it can't actually happen I mean I'm coming back to Australia and you know if it's going to happen you're going to have to join our trust and you know you're going to have to come over and teach every year so you know it's not going to happen because I knew how busy he was and he said yep no problem and then I thought oh <laughs> <laughs> because this meant uh what would I do would I now not be able to come back to Australia would I have to stay in England and I spoke to my abbot in Perth and she said well you can't really organize something if you're in Perth you'll have to stay there so it was a very scary like viscerally terrifying week for me I had for probably a couple of weeks like dreads in my stomach 
you know when you just can't even sleep and your stomach is just like almost lurching over yeah it was like that for a couple of weeks because I thought gosh I've burned my bridges the visa was suspended and I had nowhere to go I couldn't stay with my parents I hadn't got money obviously and I only had like one friend here because I lived in Asia most of my adult life so it was very scary but he was at the other end of the phone if I needed him and uh, I just started frantically scouring for like venues trying to ask people if, if they knew how to form a trust if they knew how to build a website and we just started like from there <laughs> how did how did it grow such yeah beginning. i mean i'm in disbelief now when i wake up and see this place because yeah for about five or six years i was just staying with various lay people for maybe three days maybe two weeks if i was lucky and just doing my work, trying to pull people together, trying to put the legal systems in place for this to happen and doing a lot of teaching and outreach as well. So that's how we did it. You know, we organized retreats for Ajahn Brahm every year and uh, and we reached a lot of people. And so donations started coming in and I started realizing, gosh, this is something real. And I also have a responsibility to the community that are supporting it. Mm. So um, Achan Brown, in, in his usual way, was able to inspire people in the UK to donate and things got going? I think I did most of the groundwork in the UK. I mean, his retreats were hugely important and essential to all of this. But I think it was mainly the international supporters, um, mostly from Ajahn Brown in the beginning, not so much people in the UK. So we had a big donation from somebody the first year after the first tour. And uh, Ajahn wrote me an email and said, sit down before you read the email. And I opened it and it said, a message to Ajahn Brown. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I've just donated 400,000 pounds. Wow. And I felt kind of a bit giddy because I realized now I'm in it. Mm. and they wanted to remain anonymous so it was really amazing and I know they're from like an Asian country and there were another couple of big donations but then it was also thousands and thousands of small donations from people all over the world you know people ordinary people even people in Sri Lanka at one point there was a fundraiser there and people were giving like a couple of rupees you know just to contribute so it feels amazing really that we've been able to involve and include so many people over the years. And Venerable, I'm intrigued because here are you're a bhikkhuni, but you're saying you were just living, you know, in various friends' homes, which must right. be terribly difficult. When it was, and there were people I'd just met, so. All the, well, you know, the restrictions, can I say that? Yeah. 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 So how did you I mean, it? Right. <laughs> I, I don't know, really. I mean, I guess it took a lot of faith in a sense and also it was awkward for me I mean this is part of the renunciation it can feel awkward right to ask for support yeah. yeah it can feel awkward to be in someone's house and they're feeding you and you're saying I need time to work yeah um and also there's a responsibility you want to sort of give some guidance give some advice talk about meditation so it was very very full time um but I don't know how it happened. It just sort of strung itself together. It and I also did. spent some time in America in a bhikkhuni monastery there, Aloka Vihara, which is now sadly no more. But the nuns from there have gone to other projects. Um, yeah, so I just kind of patched up my time. And every year I had this three months in Perth. Yeah. Also, the Bikuni Alliance, Alliance for Bikunis in America, supported some of my travel expenses. So I really have to give them a big uh, call out here. So yeah, the, the generosity, you know, of people, when you're living such a vulnerable life as a bikini, you really see the best of people because I wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the fact that there's so much kindness in the world. And so somewhere along the line, did you, was the first step to get a, a room or a center that was? Right, so... Yeah, so about five years in, we managed to rent a little place in Oxford. 
And the reason we thought Oxford might work is simply because there was a little insight group and I knew like one or two people. <laughs> so, and also I had I'd wanted to wait until we had a big enough outreach that people might come and stay and cook. Right. So that, that's been difficult the whole time, you know, it's like constant kind of outreach and it's, I guess that's what I mean by creating the structures that don't exist yet um, because people have got to first come to you and participate in dana to understand why it's important so getting that actually happening is actually quite hard um, but there was a very sort of slow small trickle of guests so usually just one other person staying with me so I was able to maintain my um, practice and Vinaya really well. And I understand you also began teaching, giving retreats. Some yeah, places. yeah. Yeah, I think I probably started gradually, but yeah, as soon as I got to the UK, really, um, somehow we got noticed, I suppose, because of the bringing gender equality to the Sangha. And so people started giving me opportunities to teach. And that went really well. And thanks to my teacher, <laughs> you know, and the conversations and the practice I've been able to have, um, I gradually built up my confidence in sharing the Dhamma. And uh, yeah, but the, <clears throat> the most important time in all of this was the corona pandemic. How? So that was the time I was in the first rented place. And suddenly, after a year, the corona pandemic hit and I didn't know what to do so <laughs> first I thought is this a chance to take a break to have some retreat but then I realized no I need to serve you know people are going through we're all going through something unprecedented and um, obviously I couldn't have guests at that time so I had to use one of the allowances in the Vinaya for times of danger and difficulty and I had to cook for myself so um, we basically set up systems through the help of our supporters, whereby I'd receive a vegetable delivery every week and cook myself simple meals. And I would give about three teachings a week online and the co online community started to grow. So I was getting like 60 people every time regularly. And I started noticing they're coming every week. I think we had about 300 people that were coming very regularly. So that means at least once a week or once a fortnight, like groups of 60 each time. And it was an immense support for me as well. And from this, you know, I was being fed, I was being supported through the Corona pandemic. And um, I suppose gaining that confidence, you know, as a leader of the community. And it's since then that um, we felt ready for the next step because we started meeting these people as the corona pandemic passed. We, they started coming to the events and we felt like uh, we already knew each other. Yeah. And in those teachings, those teachings on Zoom, were you giving meditation or were you giving Dharma talks or how did they uh, work out? Yeah, so on a Sunday evening, we do meditation, Dharma talk, Q&A. On a Wednesday, I do some uh, chanting to share dedications to anyone who might be struggling and suffering. And that's continued since the corona pandemic. And uh, what else did we do? We did meta meditations on a Saturday. Yeah. And later on, we started doing sutta discussions as well. Mm. So and, and now we also have silent meditations and yeah and the sutta discussions and sometimes Sunday teachings. So it's quite a thriving online community. Well, yeah. yeah. So I, I wanted to ask about the aspects of the Dharma that really resonate. And I understand metta is very important to you. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, the whole Eightfold Path is very important to me. And the more I practice, the more I move away from particular methods and more in alignment with the whole Eightfold Path. Because I think when we begin our practice, we often think that practice means meditation. And sometimes if the meditation is not unfolding in a, a particularly linear way, that's normal to a degree. But if we're having trouble in our meditation, it's often because the foundations are not fully in place. And those foundations are things we develop in our daily life through our 
way of looking at the world through the way we use our minds through the way we use our speech and you know what we give our energy to right whether through a livelihood or through the way we the people in our lives so for me the purpose has become a lot more about um an integrated way of life i, I was going to say that for many the eightfold path is a way to live in the world you know it's it's right livelihood it's right speech um and but you still find it very relevant as a because but we all live in the world is very much a bikini is at the top of the list <laughs> right yeah in terms of right livelihood i think you can't get a purer livelihood than living as a virtuous monk or not i mean you know it can be exploited like anything else it doesn't necessarily mean that because we wear the robes we live it well and that's for the lay people to be you know discerning about but um yeah the whole eightfold path is is essential for all of us and some of us might have more time to cultivate particular aspects of that path you know if we're busy working during the day then right speech right livelihood right action right intention is always should be always under that you know mm -hmm. informing that as well as right view a sense that you know there's suffering in this world are our actions of body speech and mind going to alleviate that within ourselves and in the society or are they actually building it you know through unskillful ways of looking and, and relating but um, monastics ideally do have a bit longer, perhaps, depending on the lay person. But many lay people, many of my lay friends have a lot of time for practice. They live very simple lives and make a lot of space for that. That's a privilege, of course. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we might have more time for the actual meditation practice. But still, if we're not using our mind skillfully outside of meditation practice, it's not going to be that effective. So I guess when you talked about metta, yes, I think as a cultivation, it's one of my favorite practices, but that informs right intention that then informs the rest of the path. Because in a sense, the Eightfold Path is linear. Each feeds into the next, reinforces and strengthens the next, which then feeds back on itself. So the deeper our meditation, the more we purify our view. And you see metta as a starting point or it's all circular i don't know i think people need to start wherever they can and wherever they're inspired to begin um right view is the first of the eightfold path and i think there's a reason for that if you look in the gradual training um many many times the gradual training which is found for example in the majjhima nikaya number 51 and number 128 have a look check it out it starts every time from hearing the Dhamma and preceding that, even preceding that, is a sense of understanding that we suffer, that we all suffer and we all desire our happiness, every living being. So I think when we have an appreciation of that, that can lead to a genuine motivation of loving kindness, compassion, um, generosity, nekama, giving, rather than trying to attain because we understand that our own liberation is inevitably bound up with the happiness and suffering of all beings you know if the if there is an end of suffering if the buddha teaches an end of suffering it has to be a universal solution right so suffering in many parts of the text is the start of the path so it's and not I just think about it's fantastic it's not just about personal enlightenment. I don't see how it can be. I mean, it's not that we can actually enlighten other people. We can't do the meditation for them. We can't, you know, tell them how to live. But if the meditation is bringing benefit to us, it will naturally bring benefit to others. And if our practice is motivated by compassion, not just for ourselves, but for everyone, there's, it's going to be far more powerful far more powerful it can get very dry and brittle if we're just focused on our own practice and I think from the beginning of my practice it was inculcated into me that service is an important part of the path you know my first teacher Goenka for all the limitations that we can perhaps talk about in that tradition because every tradition will have its limitations he always said that the way to measure one's progress is by a sense of gratitude and a feeling to serve others 
not by jhanas, not by enlightenment, not by my meditation getting deep, but by a feeling of gratitude and a sense to serve. And I think that's so important to understand, you know, if we're still self-centered, if we're, you know, taking to the path as a kind of self improvement or a spiritual bypass, then actually it's not going to work. Of course, there might be some some bypass, some idea of self improvement in the beginning, but it has to give way to something bigger than that. Um, then, when you uh, then when you mentioned um, uh, that a lot of your teaching is based on the early Buddhist texts, is, is that yeah. correct? And 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 why yeah. why do you, why 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 those yeah. in particular? Yeah, because the Buddha's my teacher. <laughs> and thanks to Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali as well, and all my teachers, really, um, I've started to feel a lot more connected to the teachings and I've started to uh, relate to them as though the Buddha was speaking to me. And I think that's because, you know, of my practice, but also because of the way they've been explained to me in context of practice and monastic life. And I really recommend that people try to get into the Buddhist teachings or, you know, read books or practice meditation or study the suttas alongside teachers who understand those teachings, because nobody can express the Dhamma more perfectly than the Buddha himself. I mean, if we call ourselves Buddha, Buddhists, it's because we have some amount of faith in the fact that the Buddha was enlightened. And we don't know with anyone else. We can have faith that our teachers have, you know, walked to a certain length on the path, but we don't know that. Hmm. And for me, they just start to come alive. I mean, like the example of the gradual training that I'm talking about, this is a very extended and elaborated version of the Eightfold Path. And once you start to see the entire text in that framework, then whenever you pick up a little bit from here or there, you can see the context in which it was taught and you can see how that would then feed into the next. So for example, metta is not a practice in and of itself, but it's part of right intention, it's part of right endeavor, right effort. Yeah, It's part of cultivating wholesome states, which are then going to increase mindfulness and increase samadhi. And then we'll see. Do, you, come Ill will. do you um, perhaps feel connected in any way to the early first bhikkhunis, to the first um, women who were ordained? Right. Well, one of the beautiful things about being a bhikkhuni, one of the upsides of the downsides of not having a, a living lineage now, or a very new living lineage now, is that we tend to look to the bhikkhunis in the Buddha's day as our foremothers. Can you say foremothers, like forefathers? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so let's call them our foremothers. Oh, our elders, right? They are elders, they are terries. And these were Savaka Arahats, people enlightened, you know, in the Buddha's time, under the Buddha through his in instruction. So, yes, I love to read the Terigata, and there are bhikkhunis from that time that really inspire me. I've got an amazing wooden carved statue of Patachara upstairs. It's a shame she's not here now because I'd show you her. Um, but just the serenity that the artist has conveyed through her features and presence is so deeply touching. Many of my visitors, men included, just burst into tears. They're moved to tears when they see this statue because of the story of what yes. she underwent. You know, she lost her whole family like overnight. And yet here she is serene. Perhaps you could send us a photo. Um, okay, I'll send you a photo. In the meantime, if I can show and we'll you. we'll um, send it to everyone on this um, webinar. <laughs> okay, this is this also is very special. I'd like to show you this because this is um, a clay handmade statue of another bikini in the Buddha's Whoa. day. She oh. can be anyone, so I've called her yeah. Nanda because yeah. she was given to me by a disciple of Venerable Dhammananda, the very famous pioneering bhikkhuni in Thailand. In and Thailand. Yeah. Venerable Dhammananda made her herself. Really? She actually made her. Oh, so isn't this beautiful? Fantastic. She's got a very lovely yeah. face yeah. and very human. And she's got a little tissue in her hand. Yeah. 
and she's got little feet <laughs> at the back. So beautiful. So yeah. it's really lovely to start actually having visual representations of the early Buddhist nuns yes, it is. and bringing them yeah. to life because it often is. the female history has been lost. It has, and there's not many statues of them. It's, right. It's something we've noticed here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, look, um, I just want to say to um, uh, our audience that uh, if you would like to ask a question, please put it on the chat room and I'll open up things in a minute. But first, I'd like to hear about the monastery. So we got, okay. as, far as, we got as far as hearing how you were fundraising and you had a centre or you had a room in Oxford. So right. how did uh, that evolve into, I guess, right. buying your own land, was it? and Or a home or... Yeah, a house. Or... Yeah. We don't so much build our own homes over here as, as in Australia. <laughs> Plus, I just couldn't do it <laughs> along with everything else. Um, so, yeah, it, it's amazing, really. I mean, after the corona pandemic, I didn't have anywhere to live again because the rental place was sold. Um, but we decided, we found this little four-bedroom terrace in Oxford, similar to the one we were renting, and it wasn't a monastery. It wasn't, you know, what we really aspired to. But at this point, we were kind of desperate. I was desperate to have somewhere to land, you know. By then, it was 2022. So many years after beginning this. Um, so we saw this little four-bedroom place while I was in Perth. And I didn't even go and visit it, but I just showed it to Ajahn Bami. said, just go for it. And we thought, let's just do it. So at least we've got some funds in bricks. And then last year I came back to it and found it really cute and conducive. And uh, again, you know, we started having enough guests and really wonderful guests and people looking after us. And my friend Venerable Upeka came over from Perth. She's uh, one of the bikinis I ordained with. And, uh, and so we stayed there for about nine months before the rains retreat. And then after last rains retreat, November 23, I came back, Ajahn Brown was here again, and I was talking to him about the next steps. I was saying, well, I don't want to get stuck now because we've got something. I don't want to get stuck because that's not actually a monastery and I can't train other women there. And he said, well, I don't know. We can't really do much more fundraising. There's nothing much more we can do. You know, things are slow and situations have changed. And, and I felt a little bit of despair arising. And then I caught myself and thought, OK, don't go that way. Let me just look online once more. By now, I've searched through thousands of properties around the country. So right there and then with Ajahn Brahm on the train, I looked online and this property showed up in the perfect location, my choice location of everywhere in the country. I'd kind of whittled it down to this area so that we can still maintain contact with our supporters because there aren't that many. So um, not many locally. And so I phoned the agent there and then, and I said, we've got one hour spare while Ajahn Brahm's here because he's only here another three days. Can we come and see it? And amazingly, they had an opportunity for us to come have a look. And I just looked at it, liked it immediately. That turned into liked it a lot. And by the time we were sitting down in the lounge together with Ajahn, I was like, no, I love this. This, this is perfect because a sense of just peace came over me, like a sense like I can land here. Mm. And there's a beautiful Dhamma Hall, which is where I'm sitting. Yeah. Um, this is just one lovely view outside and it goes back like this. Oh, it's lovely. This is just one room. There's another room where we have our dana, which is even a bit bigger and can take about 20 or 30 people. And what I loved is that this room for meditation is completely separate from the others. Mm -hmm. And that was always my kind of, yeah, that's like a non-negotiable. So we found this place and uh, managed to tell the retreatants on the last two days of Ajahn's tour. And we were about 800,000 pounds short, which is quite a lot of money. And so we told them just thinking, let's see. And we did a little bit of fun fundraising with like little kind of, pictures with Ajahn Brahm quotes and things like this and I was just so touched that my own volunteers who are not rich were donating like four thousand pounds for a little pack of cards with Ajahn Brahm's quotes and I was overwhelmed and then we started receiving offers of loans 
And altogether, we collected probably up to £900,000 worth of loan offers, interest-free, from people around the world. And what I noticed, the thing that made me realise we can do it, is that they were not Ajahn Brahm supporters, they were mine. And I feel like crying when I say that, because these are people that, you know, I've been serving through the Zoom and meeting and developing relationships with over many, many years. A couple of them were actually closer to Ajahn Brahm. They were kind of his disciples, but they know this project too. But they were mostly kind of homegrown through the project. And this was, so it was an inside thing, you know. And then I realised, gosh, even though we can't possibly accept all those loans with the paperwork and the auditing, you know, we're ready. This is actually right. And uh, yeah, in the end, Ajahn Brown went back to Perth like three days later and there happened to be a trustee meeting over there and they made a decision to loan us the, the funds wow. from, the, from, from there. So that's kind of, I don't know, he doesn't mind me saying this. I don't know if it really is public yet, but I've asked him and he's happy to, for that to be known. So um, yeah, the only thing now is that we still have the debt and we still have to sell the other property to pay it off. And that's becoming very labored and slow. But uh, yeah, because it's Buddhist friends, I think we're, we're going to be okay. Well done. That, that is, that is marvelous. And um, I don't know if we've got anyone from the Buddhist Society of West Australia online, but well done to them. For... Yeah. Well done to them. Cause it just yeah. so happened. They'd also had a sort of change, a shift in the trust. And I don't yeah. know if that would have been possible before everything <laughs> just lined up, you know, it was one of those magical things where for years you're thinking, how is this ever going to happen? It looks like we're kind of literally climbing a cliff. And are we just trying to push for something that isn't really ripe or people don't really want and then suddenly bang it all came together just like magic it meant to be um <coughs> excuse me Bridget is in the west and she has a question um about meditation <coughs> Bridget could you ask it oh I can read it out if you want Sprung. I thought Helen was going to read it, but hello, thank you. So firstly, just thank you for your wonderful inspiringness and good luck with everything. And my question was a very small question. When you teach retreats now, do you teach a particular meditation method or what's your style mm. that way? Thanks, yeah. Um, yeah, I think if I'm teaching a longer retreat, which means seven days and longer, um, then I would always give great emphasis to our attitude in meditation. So I would talk about how the technique you use is not as important as how you employ it. So it's not as important if you're watching the breath or if you're, you know, looking at the body sensations and trying to understand their impermanence or if you're doing four elements meditation or meta meditation. The most important thing is how you're approaching it. Like, are you really giving to the practice without expecting results are you really softening the mind you know are you um um going onto the breath too soon or are you actually cultivating wholesome states in order to receive the breath so i would talk about that a lot in the beginning but i think for me at the moment my basic orientation is to um to allow people to calm their mind gradually and to sort of understand how it's working and then naturally invite the mind to calm. I mean, I wouldn't even put it in such an active sense. It's just, I present the teachings and the mind will just pick it up on its own. So at some point I might, you know, talk about um, seeing if the breath would like to come into the mind. And if it does, how to sort of hold it, how to regard it in a really gentle way that leads to things calming. So yeah, it would generally be an inclination towards samatha, um, but also using a lot of um, wisdom into how we relate to things and also how we work with the hindrances and our emotional world. So I guess it's the gradual training really, again. Does Thank that you make for sense? that. And also, yeah. One of my teachers from a distance, obviously, is is um, 
Sidor Tejaniya, and he also puts great emphasis on the attitude of the mind, and that seems very yeah. important to you. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think there are similarities with the way that um, Sayadaw Utejaniya teaches too, yeah, yeah. I also do teach a lot of metta <laughs> as a cultivation. Oh, so Helen, you're muted. Should I read it out or did you want to? Um, I just, Sonia's put up the uh, monastery link. Um, ah, okay. Are, are you still fundraising, you know, can we donate if people want Sure, to yeah. Well, at the moment, what we need to do is um, we've got two fairly big jobs coming up. <laughs> quite a lot of money again uh one is to clean the roofs which are huge and which are full of moss and they've even got like really attractive plants growing in the sort of gullies where they meet they've got like some bush in there so that's going to cause leaks and uh, also get some insulation in the roofs because uh the place is full of large glass windows and skylights which is beautiful but the insulation is very poor so um yeah there's always something going on um often I do talk about the opportunity to even contribute food wise even from a distance but because I'm going to be in Australia very soon that's probably not um what we need right now so thank you yes um Kate I don't know if you'd like to speak but uh she wants your uh, exact address <clears throat> yeah we don't actually give the address because I'm a bikuni living here alone so this is one of the things that's been maybe slowing us down sort of in the beginning, but I also think it's created a very beautiful, quiet, protected place. Um, because I'm aware that if people could just ring the doorbell at any time of day, we would lose our quiet period. It's not like a big monastery with lots of lay people here who can handle the guests. It's really the Sangha who do that. So, um, but I can give you the approximate location and write it in the chat. Um, because then you can look it up online and it'll be really fun. But if you want to come visit us, of course, then we send you the address. We just ask that it doesn't go anywhere on social media. Because believe it or not, I might as well put this in. Being a bikuni and being female um, sometimes does attract some very strange followers, as in stalking. And it's not a small thing, actually. It's quite a serious thing. So <laughs> these are all things we've had to kind of navigate during this time. Yeah. Um, Venerable, you said you were living alone, so there's no yeah. other nuns or bikunis with you at the moment? Not on the moment, no. And even when there are, um, they're visitors. Okay. So um, I started this alone and I've sort of remained the only long-term resident. And that is one of the difficulties of the project because we've got a place, but it's obviously more work. And I'm mm. still involved in all the admin, the running of the trust, the organizing volunteers, organizing events, newsletter, promotions, everything is through me. So I don't get a lot of time to meditate. You know, at the moment, it's like my hour in the morning, hour in the evening, if I'm lucky. Um, and a lot of admin sometimes till 11 at night. So that is really um, tricky. But I mean, we have guests coming through and it's, it's going to be a long-term thing, but eventually I hope to obviously train other women and, and establish more of a resident community here. And uh, we're running out of time, but Belle yeah. is asking um, if you could talk about the rules that some people may, may not be familiar with that highlight okay, how sure. the coonies are dependent on lay people. And she's very upset about the stalking. Uh, oh, that's nice. Thank you for empathising with that. That was, yeah, that was, yeah. Internet stalking, somebody sending like, I don't know, like up to 100 emails in a month, you know, when I'm not even around. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, some of the ways we're dependent on the lay people is it, the main two ways are that we don't handle money and we don't cook. So that means we can't drive because to drive, you've got to handle money to put petrol in the car, but that's anyway a separate rule. And um, and the purpose of it is compassion for the lay people, because if we can do everything for ourselves, like garden, grow vegetables, we don't need to teach you. <laughs> we probably will, out of compassion. 
but it's to make us accountable to the lay people we support and it's to develop generosity for both parties right generosity in terms of what the lay people can offer generosity in terms of what the sangha can offer and that we can create that community spirit so that's the purpose for that and I suppose in the West or uh, capitalistic sort of cultures, um, the word dependent sounds really somehow diminishing and sort of unattractive, but actually we need to start to support one another more. And it's a beautiful thing to rely on others and to need other people because that means other people are needed. Like we need others, they're needed by us, you know? And we, we have to live together. We have to create harmonious and equitable societies. We can't just live in a bubble and, you know, live very selfish lives. Well, no, no. Thank you. I can't believe this. So one of the people on the call used to live on the on the road that I'm living on. That's just amazing. How is this, Kate? My goodness. So <laughs> that's amazing. Which which house can I even ask? I actually I was a child and I can't remember the number now on the house. Oh. But it, at the end of the road, just before you go into the field and walk to Wooten, you can walk to Wooten and you go over style yeah. road. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So I live further up near the Scout Centre. So oh, it's yeah. very, very quiet. Yeah. How beautiful. And I have friends around the area who I think might be interested in supporting. That's why I was trying to get the Amazing. Information. Thank you so much. Amazing. Your... Maybe you can have my email address, get my email address from Helen or something. Thank you so much. Um, and be in touch. Wonderful. Okay. Um, <laughs> when I'm in Oxford, thank you. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions? Any other comments? Um, if so, just unmute yourself. And yeah, please do. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'm still here. You know, I don't know how long the group has, but now I'm here. I'd really like if anybody has meditation practice questions or any questions. I'm happy to give a few more minutes. Yeah, and I noticed, and she may have gone, I noticed we've got Ranjani. Yes. And she, of course, was so instrumental in re-establishing the Bikini line. So, That's so uh, wonderful that she's and I here. Think, I think she's at Newbury Monastery. Yes, but, yes. We met last year in Perth, didn't we, yes. Ranjani? And uh, maybe sure we'll meet there. again this year. Hi, Ranjani. <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> Oh, very nice. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so busy. This place is very busy. I'm just trying to listen to you. And very successful, you know. Yeah, are, are you with your family, Ranjani? Sorry. Bikuni is very, very, yeah. Flourishing everywhere, all over the world. Happy. <laughs> Yeah, you get to see just a little bit of the monastery. So you can just see a little bit inside. Did I show you yes. the side? It's yeah. wonderful. Very pretty. Yeah. Very pretty. It's, it's in the countryside. It is in the countryside, yeah. Oh, perfect, yeah. And only five miles from Oxford, so it's great. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Somebody's asking about the teaching. So, yes, Anukampa Bikuni Project is the name of our YouTube channel. Um, yeah, Anukampa Bikuni Project. And there's so many teachings there. There's probably too many teachings there. <laughs> and, yeah, we're having... We're having a Zoom um, medley, really, in my absence. I've organized for many bhikkhunis to give teachings over the next few months. And that's coming out in our next newsletter, which is also online. So if you go onto our website, you can sign up for the newsletter and you'll have like tons and tons and tons of teachings over the summer from some bhikkhus too, but it's mostly bhikkhunis. And uh, as far as I know, we probably have more bikinis than any other organization teaching on our channel. So there's about nine lined up. So I really want to give women a platform and a voice, you know, because so often it's Ajahn such and such and the nuns in a group. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other thoughts um, or questions or reflections? I have one question, Venerable, if it's possible to ask you. Yeah. Um, yes, Belle, go ahead. Thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you for being with us. It's really amazing to hear this story um, of your your trajectory. Um, 
I have a question that was a little bit stirred, actually, believe it or not, by a psychologist I see sometimes. I've been a long time um, Buddhist. I can't see venerable on the screen, but I imagine you can see me. I can yep. see Helen. So um, nice okay. to see you too, Helen. Um, and basically it's about the strictness of one's approach to the Dharma. And I think that I have a personality that can be um, quite sort of strict about things and like maybe leaning towards asceticism. Mm -hmm. And um, I find it um, like I love the Dharma. Like the main thing I like to do with my life is listen to the Dharma and contemplate the Dharma and read and just everything Dharma and associate with really wise and virtuous people um and the idea when i go traveling it's usually in relation to some kind of dharma thing and the idea of just having fun or like a holiday or a good time it just seems really strange to me and i feel like and my psychologist challenged me his father was actually a zen monk my psychologist and he was a bit traumatized by the way he was brought up i think yeah. but he challenged me and he's like because i almost feel like i'm wasting my time if i do something like that yeah. and so i just wanted to get your take on it because it really stirred me and i thought am i like doing something wrong that I feel like okay. that okay well my reflection immediately to you is that you talked about how much you love the Dhamma how much joy yeah. it was all joy 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 so yeah. I think your psychologist just doesn't know what that kind of joy <laughs> so this is common in the world I mean if you haven't tasted another kind of happiness then of course you rely on sensuality whether it's mm -hmm. even nice humble simple sensuality nothing to condemn but yeah. if you have something that makes you happier than that then your needs in the outside world just simply lessen and that's beautiful and it's okay. not that you can't enjoy the world it's not that you can't enjoy nature yeah what it, what it means to me is that I don't need as much of it I can get happy just from looking at a leaf I don't need yeah. to climb the layers you know I can just go outside look at a beautiful leaf in the rain and I can feel joy so just Maybe, I mean, you don't have, I don't know if you want to kind of explain this to him, but for yourself, for the sake of your practice, I would yeah. say just really um, allow that joy to come up, even at the beginning of your meditation, you know, just establish yourself in that understanding of how extraordinary the Dhamma is, what it is that you love about the Dhamma, the qualities of the Dhamma. This is called Dhammanusati. And maybe even noticing the kind of resonance for that in your body, like, tuning in to any pleasure or ease or joy that arises when you think about the Dhamma and one of the things that you can also do is to then look inside and say do I have some of those qualities in my heart and you'll find that you do you have this <laughs> love for the Dhamma you have the you have respect you have kindness you have inspiration inside and allow this to gladden the mind and okay. this is the kind of happiness the Buddha allowed and said we should cultivate intentionally. And this is going to give a lot of softness and joy yeah. and openness to the mind so that when you do kind of, I don't know, do whatever you normally do in your meditation, whether it's processing emotions or watching the breath, it's going to be coming from a very loving perspective. Okay. So, yeah, so just trust your own wisdom with this, and uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't mean I'm wrong, and I should uh, I'm I should be starting to try to enjoy having lots of holidays or something because because my cycle. Okay, good. I do. I mean, I don't think that's what I'm inclined to anyway. So we can only right. just do what what feels best for us, I guess. What feels so. best for us, right? And you can tell him that you're saving lots of money too by not going on holiday. <laughs> that's very helpful thank you very much okay you're welcome so, are there any other questions or comments or thoughts um okay and i think uh, you can see venerable chanda that uh, a lot yeah. of people have found this inspiring so wonderful um, perhaps we'll wrap it up there and i really would like um there's a lot of hearts and smiles going on um, 
I really would like to thank you for taking the time when I know you're so busy and I wish you a very safe trip coming out to Australia and we're so pleased that uh, so much of your um, practice has, has happened in Australia and um, uh, just congratulations on all you've achieved. I mean, those 18 hour days, it's, it's a remarkable yeah. achievement. Uh, <laughs> um, Thank you. And so yeah. I, I point everyone to the, to the website and perhaps, you know, if you can manage a donation, I'm sure it would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, would you like, uh, can I ask you to perhaps um, uh, give us a little blessing or something? As, oh, uh, absolutely. Close? That would be wonderful. First, I'll just say thank you to you all and especially to you, Helen, for, um, you know, being very patient, actually, and waiting for my response to this. And uh, now I know how friendly and lovely and easy it is to talk to you all. I'll definitely be, uh, yeah, it was definitely not draining of my energy. It was really oh, joyful for me as well. Yeah. And uh, I also feel inspired. So thank you for your interest and your practice as well. And uh, yes, I will give you a little blessing. This is a blessing that I learned in Myanmar. It's the blessing that my teacher used to give before going on arms in uh, the early mornings. Very hot and humid, lots and lots of humidity and sort of mist and a sense that uh, there was a lot of goodness in the air. So he would chant this and then go on arms for two miles on foot. So this is just to spread metta to all beings everywhere. So just connecting with your body. Perhaps just allowing a couple of deep breaths. And just resting your attention gently on any part of the body that feels fairly easeful. Maybe pleasant, maybe just neutral. Wherever you feel at ease. Sape Sata Sape Pana Sape Buddha Sape Pogala Sabe Hatta Bawa Pariya Pana Sabe Itiyo Sabe Purisa Sabe Ariya Sabe Anariya Sabe Dewa Sabe Manusa Sabe Winipadika Awe Rahontu Abya Paja Hontu Ani ga hon tu Sukiatanam pari halan tu Dukam hon jan tu Yadalada sampadito Mawe ga jan tu Thank you. 